Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Boy, did I have fun getting here tonight. In the wonderful Sydney traffic. But I made it. I need to make you aware, first and foremost, that I am a Wiradjuri Koori Balan. And Wiradjuri is, of course, one of our many Aboriginal nations here, actually here in New South Wales, not too far from Sydney. Balang is woman in my language and Koori is Aboriginal. And I am a mother, a proud grandmother and an even greater, prouder great-grandmother to an incredible handsome little man. I need to say that because he is absolutely delicious. <laughs> and, and I tell you, if, if you haven't a grandchild, or you, if you have not had a, you know, they certainly change your life, but this little fella has is, is just brought a new depth and meaning to life. He is incredible. But in keeping with my cultural protocol, I acknowledge the Eora Nation and Gadigal people as the traditional custodians of the land that we gather on here this evening by paying my respects to the Gadigal people. And I pay my respects to elders past and present and realise the sacrifices that have been made by all of our elders across our incredible country to build a better future for us all. For our elders, all the memories, the traditions, the culture and the hopes of Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal peoples across our country. My people, First Nations people, we have the world's oldest religious system and our many different language groups have been here since time immemorial. And as a young girl, I learnt to respect it, to draw my strength from it and my spiritual connection to it, and to celebrate the unique strengths and opportunities that stem from traditional knowledge and practices. For Aboriginal people, culture and heritage is customary for our community's strength and indeed our resilience. And Australia is certainly aware of the history of our country. And we must inform the truth. We must learn from the tragedies of the past and the facts as seen through our eyes and our lived experiences. And to accept and allow all peoples of our country to go forward together. And I call upon Australia, to, all Australians, to celebrate and be proud along with my people of the richness of our country's culture and our heritage. And I ask that you stand with us and walk beside us Please do not walk ahead of us and allow my people, Aboriginal people, to share the wealth that our country has to offer. For I was taught that my ancestors will light our ways through uncertain times. I was taught to further my vision through the realisation of endeavours that protect our diverse culture, to, to protect and respect our land, our language, our emotional and our spiritual wellbeing, and our ceremonial ways of prayer. And also, through my journey, educate and nurture our children, grandchildren, and indeed my great-grandson. Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council promotes a vision of working together as one community and to achieve as one community. And our philosophy certainly prides itself on respect, patience, and, and tolerance of all Australians. The boundaries for the mighty Eora Nation spans from the Hawkesbury River to the north the Nepean to the west and the Georges River to the south. So as I stand before you this evening, as a, an elder of New South Wales Aboriginal Land Council, a member of Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council who is the cultural authority and custodian of culture, heritage, land and waters in this particular part of Eora country. It, and it, more importantly, it is with their permission that it is with respect and honour that I welcome you all to the land of the mighty Eora Nation and Gadigal people as we gather on their traditional land. And I take this opportunity certainly to thank the incredible organisation, the Sydney Peace Foundation, for their gracious invitation to allow me to come and conduct the Welcome to Country on Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council's behalf at, the, at their um, Peace Prize ceremony 
And of course, the award is going to me, the me movements. I mean, an incredible, incredible organisation. Um, and it is certainly, it inspires me to know that there is so many people that's involved within this organisation, the Sydney Peace Foundation, that care about people and support people in their time of need. So, you know, thank you for your honour. One of the things that I ask every time I get to conduct a welcome is for each and every one of us to remember our loved ones that have passed over before us, the incredible giants that have allowed us to stand on their shoulders, the beautiful people beside you right now, but more importantly, those gorgeous, precious little ones that follow in our footsteps. So may my people spirit walk and guide all of us as we continue on our journey together and let that journey be one where we can continue collectively to make our country the best, the best that it is in the world. So once again, welcome to the land of the mighty Eora Nation and Gadigal people. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Thank you very, very much. This song's called I Wanna Be Your Man.
Friends, thank you for joining us tonight and welcome to the 2019 Sydney Peace Prize Lecture. My name is Susan Biggs and I'm the director of the Sydney Peace Foundation. Thank you to Anne Weldon for her warm and generous welcome to country. I recognise the traditional custodians of the land and acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. Sovereignty over this land has never been ceded, and this is and always will be Aboriginal land. Thank you also to the amazing Sarah Blasco. Um, what a fantastic performance, and it's so great to have her here with us tonight. She will be closing, so don't think about going early. Before I introduce the chair to the Sydney Peace Prize Foundation, Archie Law, I want to acknowledge the events of recent days. The Foundation has awarded the prize to the Me Too movement because we stand with the survivors of harassment and assault. We know that to achieve peace with justice, we need to confront the issue of sexual violence and sexual harassment in all forms, in all situations. We're deeply saddened and disappointed by recent reports that survivors' confidentiality had been breached in the development of a forthcoming ABC documentary. We acknowledge those who have taken full responsibility for these mistakes and urge them to make the changes that are clearly necessary to their practices to always have a do no harm approach. We stand with any survivors in this room this evening and share our distress at the pain these events have caused. If you or someone you know is experiencing violence and needs help or support, there are national and state-based agencies that can assist you 24 hours a day, seven, day, seven days a week. And there's some flyers with the resources written down at the back, and we should have it up on the screen <coughs> sometime soon, I hope. It's now my great pleasure to welcome Archie Law to the microphone, the chair of the Sydney Peace Foundation. Uh, thank you, Susan, um, and welcome, everybody. Um, truly delighted that everyone could be here with us this evening. Um, friends, the, the Sydney Peace Foundation exists because we believe that peace is possible and that there is no peace without justice. The peace with justice that we all want to see in our lifetimes, gender justice, social justice, ecological justice, economic justice. In spite of the seemingly overwhelming nature of these struggles, more and more it seems that justice is within our grasp. 
The Sydney Peace Prize is at the heart of the Sydney Peace Foundation's efforts. In the last two decades, we've been spreading the message of peace with justice alongside some of the most inspiring leaders of our time. They include Noam Chomsky, Arundhati Roy, Pat Dodson, Naomi Klein, and Joseph Stiglitz. Our job at the Foundation is to reward some of the world's greatest change makers and bring the Sydney community together to recognise these extraordinary achievements. The prize starts a vital public debate and creates a platform to ensure that these voices are heard. And by sharing these stories of vision and courage, the Sydney Peace Prize reminds us all that a peaceful, equitable and just world is possible. Tonight, the Sydney Peace Foundation is absolutely thrilled to be awarding the Sydney Peace Prize to the Me Too movement. We sincerely thank the jury for their deliberations and decisions, uh, and thank you, and they deserve a round of applause. <laughs> Tonight's prize recognises the massive achievements of the Me Too movement, and our guests, Tarana Burke and Tracy Spicer, are two of the leaders who have demanded that we act now to end sexual harassment and violence. The 2019 Sydney Peace Prize jury chose the Me Too movement from over 200 nominations from the community. And the Me Too movement has changed the way that we understand and talk about sexual harassment and violence by highlighting its breadth and its impact around the world, in the home, in public spaces, and workplaces, and for that we sincerely thank them. Um, so thank you all for your support uh, for, for coming out tonight. We greatly appreciate it at the Foundation, and I'm sure you're going to have a terrific evening uh, celebrating the recipients of the 2019 Sydney Peace Prize. Uh, it now gives me great pleasure to welcome the Honourable Tanya Plibersek MP uh, to the stage. Thank you. I want to start by thanking Auntie Anne for her very generous welcome to country and to also acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on tonight, to pay my respect to elders past and present and to acknowledge that this land was never ceded. It's wonderful too to be here with so many friends and so many sisters and I want to acknowledge all the feminists in the room. <laughs> Many of us know Me Too as a hashtag that went viral globally in 2017, a moment when millions of people, the majority of them women, used those two words to say that they had been sexually harassed or sexually assaulted. The hashtag Me Too was shared 12 million times on Facebook alone in the 24 hours after Ashley Judd first used that hashtag to talk about the film industry. But of course, that's not where the story starts. 71% of Australians have been sexually harassed at work. One in three Australian women will be a victim of domestic violence, and one in five Australian women will be a victim of sexual violence. Don't tell me that if any other thing were causing that sort of injury and death, we wouldn't be taking action as a community against it. Even knowing those statistics, watching the flood of tweets and Facebook status updates was truly shocking because for some of us, it was the first time that a friend, a relative, a work colleague had disclosed their sexual harassment or sexual assault. The insidious thing about sexual harassment and sexual violence is that for so long, our culture has taught victims to be shamed and to be silent, to bury what has happened to them. 
When survivors are shamed into silence, perpetrators are protected. When millions spoke up, that shield of silence was shattered. That glaring spotlight on the pervasive nature of sexual harassment and sexual violence was an important moment. It made it clear around the world that the stories that women had often told each other quietly and privately were not occasional isolated incidents, but a deep and widespread problem. It wasn't just bad, one bad boss. It wasn't just one awful workplace, not just one country or one occupation. Everywhere, all the time. Women stepped up to take on the enormous number of stories about assault and harassment in the workplace, striving to hold the abusers accountable. But Me Too didn't start in 2017, and the work of Me Too didn't stop when the hashtag stopped trending. As the founder of Me Too, Tarana Burke, said, a moment is not a movement. Me Too is a movement, not just the moment that brought it to worldwide public attention. And of course, it's also a work in progress. We still have so much to achieve. That extraordinary viral moment created an opportunity to advance the movement, the movement to support survivors, to help them find justice, to create community action to build a world without sexual violence. The movement that so many of you in this room have been part of for years, if not decades. So I pay tribute to those in this room who've done that work, dedicated their lives to helping end sexual violence and sexual harassment, to helping people find the resources they need and the justice they deserve. In a country where one in four women and one in 10 men has been sexually harassed in the workplace in the last five years alone, and only 17% made a formal report or complaint, the importance of this work is undeniable. You are part of a movement to make our workplaces, our public spaces, and our homes safe. Both moments and movements need extraordinary leaders, and we have, we have several of them here with us tonight, including the woman I'm delighted to be introducing, Antoinette Braybrook. Braybrook. And I'm so looking forward to hearing from Tarana and Tracy later on. Antoinette has been the CEO of JIRA since its inception 17 years ago. She's the chair of the National Forum. And JIRA is a Victorian Aboriginal community-controlled organisation specialising in working with Aboriginal women, mothers, children, experiencing family violence. It provides culturally safe legal and case management support as well as delivering early intervention prevention programs. Antoinette is widely recognised around Australia and internationally, and it's my great pleasure to introduce her tonight. Thank you. I begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land we're gathered on, uh, the Gadigal people and, uh, from the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to elders past and present. I'm an Aboriginal woman. I was born on Wurundjeri country, but my family are Cookie Yalanji in far north Queensland. I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people present this evening. Me too, powerful, international, so visible, from Tirana to Tracy, from Mona to Monica. Me Too is a thunderclap from women against a particular form of injustice. But for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, Me Too is not enough. It is not enough 
to recognise that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women experience sexual harassment and all too often sexual abuse at work. And it is not enough to recognise that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, like others, experience harassment on the streets and the casual everyday misogyny, which sadly barely, women barely notice after a while. It is just not enough. But Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women need much more than me too. We are not just women. We are women who suffer the impacts of colonisation, our stolen land, denied the right to speak our language, forbidden to practise our culture, our babies and children ripped from our arms, some will, who never will again feel the embrace of family, the nurture of culture. Do you know, I used to see my mum hiding behind the trees in the laneway watching my brother and I at lunchtime at school. I only realised a few years ago why she did that. She was terrified that we would be taken and she was trying to protect us. Tonight, I want to focus your minds and maybe your hearts too on this systemic, systematic violence and racism. Let's talk numbers. What I'm about to say next is horrifying, but I beg you, don't switch off. These may be just statistics to you, but for us, for me, they are personal and devastating. Sitting with these numbers is every Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person in this room. Look around. See us all. This is what's happening to us. Today, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women are 34 times, yes, 34 times more likely to be hospitalised because of family violence. And we are 10 times more likely to die from a violent assault than other women. Heard enough? We are more likely to have our children removed than other women. Our kids become lost in a big white system. Lost. Know that today there are about 18,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in out-of-home care, about 10 times the rate of other children in this country. Many live with families outside of community, disconnected from kin. That is another way governments destroy our culture. Our people are the most incarcerated in the world today. Our women are the fastest growing prison population in our country. Australia-wide, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women make up just 1% of the population, but one third of the female prison population. We are imprisoned at 20 times the rate of other women and 13 times the rate of men who are not Aboriginal. More than 80% of our women in prison are mothers and 90% have experienced family violence and sexual violence. Our babies are stillborn at double the rate of other women. And even if they live, our kids are five times as likely to suicide. In the first 10 days of January this year, five Aboriginal girls suicided in separate incidents in Western Australia, Townsville, Adelaide. The girls were aged between 12 and 15. Between 12 and 15 years old. These are our babies, our children, 
our future. Statistically, as an Aboriginal woman, the non-Aboriginal women in this room will outlive me by nine years. Had enough? Me too. I want you to understand that our fight is broader than gender. It must be. Our fight is also about race, to fight the stigma associated with being black in this country, our country. We must confront the forces that demonise us daily in the media, that blame us for what white colonisation continues to do to us. As an Aboriginal woman, it is an honour to be standing here in front of you. It is an opportunity to change the story. But let me be clear, you cannot and will never change this by taking charge, problem solving and speaking for us. That approach makes us silent and invisible. You can be a real ally, stand beside us, not in front of us and not over us. Support our women leaders and their communities by understanding that self-determination for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and all of our people is the only true, honourable and valid way forward. Learn about the real history of our country. Respect us as First Nations people nurturing the land, our families, our kinship systems. I ask you to put your energy, commitment and power behind our cause. I ask you to put your money into our fight. Our governments claim violence against women is a national priority, but here are the facts. While we welcome the recent funding commitment from the federal government for our frontline work until 2023, our organisations are still in crisis. We have not received a real increase in the past six years, six years to properly meet our service, frontline services for women's safety. And we continue to lurch from funding cycle to funding cycle. Our national body that represents the voices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women experiencing family violence still has no funding certainty from our federal government beyond 30 June next year. We are the only body that represents the voices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women on family violence. And we are at risk of losing our voice and visibility. Our voices must be at the centre of the national conversations, not sidelined and not shut out. Tonight, with incredible women on the stage and in the audience, we can link the needs of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, so often ignored and rejected, with the global Me Too movement. Thank you, Tracy Spicer, for moving over to give voice and visibility to the courage of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and the integrity of our cause. My big ask is this. Become an activist beyond Me Too, a champion for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women's rights, our self-determination, but follow our lead. And you can always give money, it's easy, we need it. And you can donate at https colon forward slash forward slash www.givenow.com.au forward slash f V P L S. Accept that for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, Me Too is powerful. But it's not enough. It's Me Too. But it must be us too. Me Too, us too. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you to the Sydney Foundation for this incredible honor. It is beyond humbling to have this work recognized in this way. And I'm deeply appreciative to you and the people of Australia for this recognition. So thank you. Oh. Almost 15 years ago, I tried to not do a thing and failed. <laughs> I know that sounds a little ominous, so I will explain. Um, I'm the product of a family that was incredibly socially conscious. My grandfather strongly believed that it was imperative that I know my history as a black person in America. So he insisted on me reading scholarly texts about the contributions of Africans in the world and the origins of Africans in America while I was still in junior high school. And my mother wrapped me in black feminist literature from a very early age so I was sort of reared loving the likes of Maya Angelou and Toni Morrison and Alice Walker and Nikki Giovanni before I read a word of Shakespeare. The wealth of information my family imparted um, with me made me smart and curious, and it also helped me to be able to identify injustice when I saw it. I could call it out and talk about it, but the information I got from my family didn't give me the tools to really do anything about it. That changed when I turned 14 years old and I joined an organization called the 21st Century Youth Leadership Movement. 21st Century, as it's called, was founded by veterans of the civil rights and black power and labor movements and other movements of the 60s and 70s in America. The mission of the organization was to produce a new generation of grassroots community organizers who could carry on their legacy of work. They gave me the tools to do something about all of the injustice that I could only call out previously. So I was a different sort of kid. I had the privilege of knowing very early on that I wanted to be in service of my community and others pushed to the margins before I was even out of high school. And as a consequence of having had made up my mind so early in life, it meant that I often found myself wandering into and then welcoming new fights. Racism, police brutality, sweatshops, fair housing, grassroots political organizing, you name it. I was to be a part of it. My friends jokingly call me the uh, Forrest Gump of social justice, but I don't think that's funny. But I felt called to do so. I felt that call as an organizer in college. I felt it when I finished college and joined the 21st century staff to train other youth leaders. And I felt it when I started an organization called Just Be Inc. that was dedicated to the health and wholeness of young women of color. Each and every time I felt that call, there was never a question in my mind whether I would answer it. It felt like my duty. But when the call came in my spirit to do something about the rampant sexual violence that I was witnessing in the lives of the young girls in my community, I didn't want to answer. I knew that answering this particular call meant dredging up a part of myself that I had carefully and neatly locked in a box and put high on a shelf. I knew it meant facing the kind of fear and shame and guilt that no reasonable person would invite into their lives. So I knew it would require a kind of courage that I was often accused of, but never quite had to walk in with both feet. But it was the venerable poet, author, and wise maven, Dr. Maya Angelou, who once said, courage is the most important of all virtues, because without courage, you can't practice any other virtue consistently. So as much as I didn't want to embark on this work when it was put in my spirit to do so, I failed at resisting this call. And that same courage that I had to muster up to partake in this work is the courage that compelled so many survivors from all walks of life with any number of experiences to come forward two years ago using the hashtag MeToo. In 2017, the viral MeToo hashtag magnified the prevalence of sexual violence across the globe 
and across identities, economic status, religions, disabilities, and more. As a result, what started as a very local grassroots Me Too movement has grown into an international survivor-led community working to highlight the breadth and depth of sexual violence and to support survivors' pathways to healing while addressing the gaps and barriers in resources for survivors and galvanizing a broad base of survivors to disrupt the systems that uphold the global prolifer proliferation of sexual violence. The Me Too movement is fueled by the idea of empowerment through empathy and courageous community action. In short, we are a movement about healing and action. I almost lost my place, y'all. Hold on a minute. <laughs> this is technology. I'm often asked if I'm surprised by the widespread growth of the movement since the viral hashtag. And my answer is always the same. I am not. In the US, one in four girls and one in six boys will experience sexual violence by the time they reach 18. In Australia, that number is one in six girls and one in nine boys by the age of 15. And around the world, those numbers are about the same. Most of those children grow up to be adults who still carry those wounds. And if you manage to make it out of childhood without experiencing some form of sexual violence, statistics show us there are several more instances where it is likely to occur as you grow along, especially if you're a woman especially if you're a poor woman, especially if you are a poor woman of color, or queer, or trans, or disabled, or indigenous. I'm not surprised because sexual violence can affect everyone. And because it is extremely isolating, we crave community as survivors. And that is what the hashtag gave us, space to be seen and heard and create community. So how did a, a moment that was so desperately needed in order to boost a movement that is so desperately needed for people who have already experienced a spectrum of trauma get reduced to a witch hunt? I keep coming back to the idea of empathy and courage because both of them are at the core of what is needed for us to adequately respond to the millions of people who so bravely came forward. This movement is not about creating a witch hunt or targeting powerful men or women's revenge. And what does it say about the person who can witness the outpouring of stories across the world and reduce it to women's histrionics or faux outrage? I've taken up too much time already. I knew I was going to, so I wrote it in my speech. <laughs> but I don't want to leave Australia without driving home the message that the Me Too movement is bigger than what so many of us think. When a singular hashtag inspires more than 180 countries to translate it into their own language and country, countries like China to even find ways to add their voices to the chorus, you are talking about a movement about possibility. When thousands of people join together to put their bodies on the line, marching and protesting to say that they won't stand for sexual predators, predators to take and be in positions that will make decisions about our bodies, we are talking about a movement about power. When an 83-year-old survivor of sexual abuse feels supported enough to come forward and finally release the story that she's been holding in the pit of her stomach for 75 years, we are talking about a movement about love. And when a little black girl from the Bronx makes up her mind that she will not be consumed by the thing that tried to kill her every day of her life, but she will turn that pain into a pathway to healing and action for others like her. We are talking about a movement about vision. I am grateful that this work is being recognized as peace work by the Sydney Peace Foundation.
I hope others will see that the work of ensuring that future generations can live without violence, particularly sexual violence, is social justice work, and it is peace work. We are not out here working to simply raise awareness. There is enough data and stories and information to make everyone aware. And as the brilliant author and scholar Dr. Imani Perry says, awareness in and of itself is not a virtue without a moral imperative. This is our moral imperative. I hope each of you carries that message with you when you leave here and know that this movement doesn't exist without you. So I urge you to join us. And if you are ready to stand with survivors and allies around the world, don't worry if you don't know where to start. Don't worry if your hands tremble a little bit. There are enough of us out here to welcome you, guide you, and help you find your place. So if you are ready to join this fight to end sexual violence and ensure that survivors have what they need to craft their own healing journey, I can only leave you with these two words. Me too. Thank you. Charana, thank you so much for your empathy, for your courage, and for your action. How about another round of applause for Charana Bach? Oh, is that on? Oh. Hello? Yep. Oh, it's on. Perfect. <laughs> um, before we begin our, our brief chat, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we're meeting on, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and also reinforce those powerful messages from Antoinette that we know that people in marginalised communities, particularly Indigenous women and children, experience these issues that we're talking about at an exponentially higher rate. I'd also like to thank Artie Ann for her beautiful welcome. Tarana, we've had the great privilege of travelling a bit together this week, and I have to say, I don't know how you do it, especially after working in this sector for 30 years. How are you? Well, oh, <laughs> me, me. Yes, how are you holding up? First, I have to, to stick, take a step back and say, Tracy, I want to acknowledge you as well, and I forgot to do that in the speech, and congratulate you for also accepting this award, and thank you so much for creating this space for us to chat, so. <laughs> um, how am I is somewhat of a loaded question, particularly now when I'm not really sure what day it is in Australia. <laughs> um, but I am, I am okay. I, um, I don't want to be dishonest in this question. I get asked it all the time in this answer, rather. Um, I am constantly trying to figure out what okay is. And I think that's just a reality in this work or in work that is similar to it, that um, you know, I already had to figure out what boundaries looked like for me and what, excuse me, self-care looked like for me um, before the viral moment and all of this attention. Um, and that has shifted again, and I've had to figure it out again. What I can say is that I do believe in boundaries. I do believe that um, they're very necessary for us to, to survive in this work. I am often uh, invigorated by the people around me, particularly survivors who are just you know, wide-eyed and ready to jump into this work and, and just so ready to put their, themselves um, on the front line. And I, I have a very, you know, I have my daughters here. Oh, there. My daughter is here. Um, you know, one of my favorite people in the entire world. And so I draw a lot of strength from my child, from my partner, from my friends. So I just, I just keep it really close. Um, and I just, yeah, I'm just still figuring it out. Yeah, you take those moments to heal when you need to heal. Yeah, I mean, healing is ongoing. So I am, you know, there are some days, and I, and I tell survivors this all the time, I have so many people who say to me, oh, you know, you've done so much work, I can't wait to get where you are, or I can't wait to get healed like you, and I'm like, that, that's not how it works. <laughs> you know, I still get triggered, I still have very bad nights, I still have times where, where, where the trauma that I've experienced takes, takes hold of me, but the difference is I have this body of evidence now that lets me know that I don't live there. 
what used to happen was that when I would have bad moments, I felt like that's what I deserve, right? I would have, this is, this is, this is just where I live. This is where I have to exist and dwell now. But I have built up the muscle because healing is a muscle that you have to keep exercising. And I've built up the muscle strong enough now. And my little, my little box of, I, I want, I'm trying not to say arsenal because I'm trying to be nonviolent, but, <laughs> but the little box of things that you can use. I've, I've collected enough evidence that lets me know and lets, allows me to work through those moments because I know I won't stay there. You know, so it's just, it's a, it's a work in progress. We're all a work in progress. We're all figuring it out as we go along. And I try to pass on what works for me to other people and then to help people figure out what can work for them. Yeah. You mentioned the other day that people keep coming up to you and saying, when's the next big Me Too moment <laughs> like this? And you describe it as a star in a jar. And that's just not going to happen again anytime soon, is it? I doubt it. I doubt it. I mean, I think we'll probably still have the big salacious headlines and the blah, blah, blah person who got accused of blah, blah, blah. But that moment that we had when Me Too went viral, that first 24 to 48 hours and that first week and in the, in the first year, we just won't have that. I doubt that we would have that again. And I think that we can't rely on that. So that's, that, that's not even sustainable, right? It's not sustainable to think that a movement can be grounded in a viral moment. You know, and I think part of the reason why Me Too has succeeded to move beyond that viral moment is one, it had a foundation that started before it, but also myself and others who do this work were able to come in right away and say, we have a vision for a way forward. And so what people have to understand is if you are passionate about this work, or even if you are just have a modicum of compassion about the idea that we should not live in a world with sexual violence, you can't wait to be energized and excited by the next shiny thing that happens. You have to know that when they stop reporting about it on CNN or the BBC or the ABC or the CS, CBS, whatever your SBS, you know, whatever the you know, when, when it stops being a topic of conversation in the media and it stops being this salacious thing that gets all kind of attention, there's still going to be sexual violence. It's still going to exist unless we are intentional and committed to interrupting it every day. And that, has, that is unrelated to any headline. Let's drill down a bit on that because there's a lot of activists and advocates in the room here. To a lot of wonderful people. Yeah, I'm going to give this a round of applause. <laughs> We're at a, a time of a uh, pretty extreme backlash, it has to be said. How do activists and advocates keep going? And is it about storytelling or policies and procedures or cultural change, or is it everything? Well, I'll take those as two different questions. I think, one, you know, I, get, I also get asked often, you know, how do you keep going with the backlash, and da 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 And I'm gonna say this to folks in the, in the audience, particularly those in my tribe who do this work. It's just like, well, I don't want to get too deep, but I was going to say it's just like Christianity, but you know, this idea that we have to be martyrs or that you have to be, to martyr yourself in a particular kind of way in order to be, um, to, to say that you're doing the work well. And so many of us who do social justice work in any form, but definitely around sexual violence, um, feel like we have to martyr ourselves. And so what I say to people who say, well, I'm burnt out, what should I do? I say, quit. And I mean, I mean, I'm not being funny. You can come back, and more than likely you will. But I have put this down several times in the last 30 years, right? I have had to step back or move and do other things. And I think that we have to understand that in a movement such as this, particularly with so many of us who are at the forefront are also survivors, your healing is also movement work. And so if you're tired and you're burnt out and it's too much and you can't take it, do not push yourself beyond your limits because that's not effective. That doesn't help the movement. What helps the movement is to have healthy whole, examples of what healthy, whole people who are in the healing process look like. So take care of yourself and heal and do the work that you have to do for yourself because that is also movement work and be okay with that. Don't let anybody shame you or make you feel bad or make you feel like, oh, I gotta get back out there, I'm not doing enough. Anything you do toward the work of ending sexual violence is enough. And working on yourself is that work. Mm. <laughs> the 
wonderful Archie Law said before that peace can only come from justice. So how do we seek that justice and what does it look like? You know, again, justice looks different for different people. And we can't, I won't be prescriptive and say, well, let me tell you how justice has to happen. Because what looks like what I need for justice is, is different with some, with, from some, what somebody else might need. And so justice starts with accountability. And accountability can look many different ways. It just has to be led by the person that was harmed. I think that part of the problem is that, and I've, I've you know, forgive me if you heard this, I talk about this a lot, but part of the problem is that when we think about justice, our framework for justice is crime and punishment. Yeah. Right? We've, we, most of us grow up in societies that say, you, this is a law, you commit a crime, you get punished in this way. But so much of what we experience in sexual violence doesn't rise to the level of crime. And so then what do you do? What does justice look like for you when you can't put a person in jail? And if you, even if you can put a person in jail, we know by statistics that so many of these cases don't ever get to see the inside of a courthouse or even a police squad, right? So if you tie your healing or if you tie your, the idea of justice solely to this idea of crime and punishment, there's going to be a deficit there without question. The focus, I think, has to be on harm and harm reduction. That is, that is the, a, a shift in framework, and it gives you an expansive idea of what justice can look like because it gives you an expansive idea of what accountability can look like, right? And then as a survivor, you can say, this is, you've harmed me in whatever kind of way. And then I have the choice about what I need to feel whole. Justice has to start with what the survivor needs. And the survivor has to be the one leading that conversation. And so if we could shift our framework and think about the ways in which people are harmed that have nothing to do with crime. If you harm a person, just the laws of human kindness, I don't know, I'm making that up, but just, just if you're a decent person, right? But if you harm somebody, you should have to be accountable for that harm. That could mean a conversation. Mm. That could mean any number of things, right? But, but we have to move away from this kind of finite thinking about justice because so many of us won't ever see it. Mm. While we're reframing the language and the debate, mm -hmm. I was very interested in the terminology used at the National Press Club about it being a public academic, uh, epidemic. Yeah, public Do health we, crisis. Public health crisis. Do we need to talk about it more from a health and safety framework as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. This is a, this is a, most people think about sexual violence and, and it's very individualized, right? And so it becomes your problem, not our problem. And so there are several ways that we have to shift that narrative so people understand and take it away from the individual. So what happens is that people engage the virus from a place of pity and a place of need. So you need resources. Oh, you poor thing that's happened to you. Let me give, you know, we do need resources. I'm not saying that, but, but that's where people stop. Because if you only stop at putting a Band-Aid on it with the resources, then that shields you from looking at the systemic problem. It, it shields you from looking at the systems that are in place that allow the proliferation of sexual violence to happen, right? I'm gonna put some money on this and then I'm gonna take it back because you don't really need that much. And so the, 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 some of the ways that we have to, um, to change that narrative are very important to the progress of the work around ending sexual violence, right? It's just, I call it, a, I, I talk about it as a public health crisis because I think people need to understand just how pervasive this is. At the, at the health, at the uh, press club, I use the example of a, an infectious disease because I think that helps people to see and understand because they think about their own set, um, health and safety. But you had 12 million people respond to a singular hashtag in 24 hours. That's an incredible number of people and every hashtag is a human being. Every hashtag is a person who sat behind their computer contemplating if they should do it or not. What happens if they say it? What are the consequences of this? It was decisions being made. These are real people connected to real life stories. And if you think about 12 million people tomorrow, if we woke up and 12 million people said, I have this thing too, 
I've got it, and she's got it, and he's got it, and they've got it. Like, across the world, people have this thing, too. But you can see it. It's a rash on your arm, or it's a, a thing that you can look at, right? The questions will be completely different. In fact, there would be questions. And they wouldn't look like, well, how do we date now in the age of this nasty disease? Do you know, can you imagine how horrified we would be if the newspapers covered this thing like that? It just makes no sense to me that we don't think about the people who actually said me too. And for every one of those 12 million, there's probably five more that couldn't say it or couldn't use the hashtag. So we absolutely have a public health crisis. If you are not a survivor, you know one or both. And that's the reality of what we're dealing with. People, and that's why it's a dangerous narrative to think of Me Too as a singular, in a singular area. Sexual violence happens on a spectrum. And I'm talking about from harassment and, and lewd and rude language that is, that is um, sexually violent or inappropriate, all the way to femicide. It's a, it's a huge spectrum. No, I'm not trying to put all of those things in one pot. But I'm very clear that if we don't deal with harassment and nasty jokes about rape and, and rape culture and all the things on this end that people think are benign or not really harmful, those things create a culture that allows for violence to happen. So they are just as important. We don't deal with them the same, but they have to be dealt with. Mm. And what so many people are saying now is, oh, you're making too much out of this. This person is just friendly. They just want to hug. It's just a joke. I like to laugh. I love jokes. But there are tons of ways to tell a joke that have nothing to do with rape. I highly recommend everyone in the room. Yes. Have a look online at the sexual violence pyramid because that is exactly what Tarana has articulated so well here. Speaking of which, you have a tremendous power of influence with your language and your cut through and your eloquence. It's true, you're an incredible influencer and I don't mean in the kind of Instagram language. How can all of us in the room use our own power with our families and our communities to convince those who might be apathetic about Me Too? You know, there's so much, this, this has to happen kitchen table by kitchen table, living room by living room in so many ways. And so, I, you know, uh, I get a, a lot of questions about folks who say, you know, I get it and I understand what Me Too is about, but when I go home, you know, my uncle says so and so. And in, on the one hand, there is a way that I, I understand that it is too hard to try to undo what's happening in your family. There's some ways that your grandma and your uncle and them are just never going to be different. But there's also, there's, there's a, I'm going to be sappy for a minute. There is a love connection that I think we don't um, make use of enough. So for instance, this is what I mean. I, I had a student once who said, I wanna tell my mom about what happened to me, but I don't think she will take it well. She may not believe me or you know, my mom and my dad. And I, and I said, you know, I get that some people are difficult. I get there are cultural differences that, that, that many people respond to it. But at the end of the day, most of the people in your family or your loved ones want you to be okay. And so their entry point into understanding this movement or this work is through your personal story. And so where it is appropriate and, it's, and, it's a, and you think it can be effective, I encourage people to, to use their personal stories in their families or to connect it to things that they understand and they love, right? It, it's really important for us, you know, I used to get really irritated <laughs> and I think a lot of feminists do, when you know, men would say to me, oh, I love the work you're doing because you know I have a daughter. <laughs> I was like, I'm sort of a human being, but it's okay. You know? <laughs> you know, I, and I would say, why can't, you, why can't men just understand this is about humanity? And they should, <laughs> fellas. Um, stop talking about your wives and your daughters as if that's all that matters. But also, I don't push back against that anymore and too tough because I will take any entry point available. If you are more interested in this work and understanding this movement because you want to keep your daughter safe, that's fine. Come on in. 
we will take you, and hopefully by the time you leave, you will see that all women are human beings. <laughs> but whatever the entry point is, I think it's, it's fine. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to fight with men about why they are here. Right? I don't want to fight with people. I had a, my, my um, child is gender non-conforming. And it, it has allowed me, I remember when they came and told me that this was their identity, and I was very like questioning and asking all kinds of things and you know, just bristling at it. And I, fa I fa fancied myself, you know, I'm a social justice person, I'm very liberal, and you know, when they came out as queer, I was like, of course you're queer, that's wonderful, right? You know? And then they added this other layer, and I was like, huh. And I remember this, in the United States there is uh, enormous, and it, it maybe here too, I'm not sure, but there's an enormous issue of black trans women being murdered. And I remember when I was reading these stories about these black queer trans women being murdered and thinking about my queer black child that is in the trans community, that is gender non-conforming and has friends who are trans. And I realized just how um, disingenuous I had been prior to that. My concern about the LGBTQ community was making sure I said LGBTQ. And I made sure I added them in when I talked about blah, 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 blah. But my, my concern changed when it became my child's life might be on the line. Right, so I don't begrudge men who say, oh, I'm doing this for my daughter or my wife because I get it. We are connected to things that are connected to us. We are more connected to things. So I'll take you however you come. Uh, I don't even know if I'm answering the question now. I'm just kind of... You have answered just it. Just kind of ch chatting. You, <laughs> you have answered it beautifully. Thank you so much for your pragmatism, your wisdom, and your deep well of courage. Please thank Tarana Burr. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Tirana. Thank you, Tracy. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here at Town Hall tonight for this incredibly inspiring night um, for the Sydney Peace Prize Lecture and our award ceremony. I, I want to acknowledge, I, I, I want to thank Anne for her welcome and also acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of our land, and pay my respects to their elders past and present and also acknowledge the people of the very many nations who live in our city. I'd like to also acknowledge Dame Mari Bashir, Tanya Plibersek, Sydney City Councillors, Archie Law, and I would like to thank Tarana, Tracy and Antoinette for inspiring us tonight. And, and I'd like to say to Anto Antoinette that your figures are truly shocking. And I want to assure you that we stand with you here at the City of Sydney. <laughs> Our speakers tonight have shown that any woman, regardless of her background, can become the target of men's violence. But the most marginalised in our community are the most vulnerable. The Sydney Peace Prize was established 21 years ago to recognise outstanding contributions to peace, to justice, to non-violence and to human rights. And the City of Sydney has been a proud supporter throughout those years. The prize represents the best that we can hope for our city, a place of peace, of respect, of equality, a place where all voices can be heard and all people count. And so, as a symbol of our partnership with the Sydney Peace Foundation, an expression of our hopes for our city and its people, we are proud to host the City of Sydney Peace Prize Lecture. I am pleased that so many of you have joined us tonight to acknowledge me too as the 2019 Sydney Peace Prize recipient. This prize seeks to recognise everyone who has contributed to this important and growing movement. 
Gender equality and workplace harassment are issues for all of us and issues that we have, have recognised need tackling in our own workplace here at the City. Since 2004, the City's female workforce has grown by 45.5%. Women now make up over 40% of the city's workforce and occupy 49.7% of leadership positions, including several leadership roles in male-dominated sectors. In 2015, the city began monitoring and publicly reporting on gender pay equality. And we were the first local government to do so. I'm pleased to report that in the 2018-2019 review, the report revealed an overall gender pay gap of 7.8% in favour of women, meaning, <laughs> meaning more women are employed in higher paying jobs organisation wide. This is significantly better than the national average of 14% in favour of men. So that 7.8 in favour of women here at the city, the Australian national average is 14% in favour of men. My hope is that our organisation and others can show by doing that we can demonstrate women's capabilities and talents and we can show that men and women can work harmoniously and equally together. Tonight's speakers have shown us not only what still needs to be done, but that there are courageous, articulate and passionate women who will continue to call out sexism and violence and racism and show us that there is a better way forward. I thank them all and I congratulate them on their courage and their empathy and ask, you, ask them now to accept the award on behalf of Me Too. Only coming over here to say words so I can put this down for a minute. Actually, I think Tracy, you should say a few words to the people since they haven't really heard from you tonight. I'll just <laughs> make some space for you. Oh, Toronto, I'm just so honored to be standing up here with you. Um, that's the first thing that just popped into my mind. Um, look, these awards are for every survivor of sexual harassment and assault, those who have found their voices and those who are yet to find their voices. Uh, this award, the Australian one, the money associated with it, will go towards JIRA and the wonderful organisation run by Antoinette Braybrook. <laughs> Antoinette, your speech was astounding. I thought it was just incredible. Um, this Australian award will be on public display and we'd like to make a public competition for where it will be displayed. So please use the hashtag Sydney Peace Prize. We want to know where you would like to see this award. Thank you so much for coming along. I'm only, I'm only echoing... Um, Tracy, and that this is absolutely dedicated to the courageous survivors who came forward to say Me Too in 2017, but those who also didn't and who have still not found the courage, if you will, or the wherewithal to do it. I want you to know that you don't have to. We exist, I exist, my work is here so that you don't have to. You don't have to ever say the words Me Too to be a part of the Me Too movement because this work will continue. Thank you.
Uh, thank you, Clover. Um, and as a, an ally and a supporter, um, it, it's been a really humbling experience to, to share the stage with, with you all this evening, and I, I thank you for that, that privilege. Um, I thank you, Tarana. I thank you, Tracy, uh, Antoinette, um, Tanya, um, Sarah, who will be with us in a minute to, to close this evening, and, and of course, you, Clover. Um, and Susan. <laughs> uh, and I'd also just like to, to thank the University of Sydney for all of their support to the foundation. We're a foundation of the university. Uh, also to uh, the City of Sydney, who's such an important partner and it's so wonderful to be here uh, and hosted by Clover and her team this evening, so thank you. Um, we have a number of partners uh, in, in, in this event, so I'd particularly like to, to sound out the United States Study Centre uh, at the University of Sydney, the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at, at the University of Sydney, um, the Australia Institute, who've done so much on the, the Canberra leg of this trip, which was such a, a blinding success. So thank you uh, to them. Um, I'd also like to thank all of my colleagues at the Sydney Peace Foundation. We know there's not that many when I say all of them. Uh, but I'd like to thank uh, my fellow councillors. Uh, again, it's, a, it's an absolute honour and privilege to work with all of you uh, on, on the council. I, I enjoy every minute of it, so thank you. And in particular, I, I would like to have a, a huge shout out to, to Susan, to Katie, and the volunteer A team at the Sydney Peace Foundation. They've made this week such a success. They've made this evening such a success. And I think we deserve to give them a big round of applause. So thank you all for coming. Um, and to close this evening, I'd, I'd like to, to welcome Sarah Blasco back to the stage. So thank you. Hey, thanks very much. What an inspiring night. I've really, yeah, loved it. Thanks so much for everyone that's spoken.
And I'm tired of guilt I'm tired of being sorry Haven't we suffered enough? We won't run We can fight All that keeps us up at night There is far to go now Let's not waste a minute more We won't run We can fight All that keeps us up at night There is far to go now Let's not waste a minute more But all that our eyes will be all